trying to press its way into your life, into my life, and it is pushing harder and harder and harder all the time, not because culture is trying to dictate any more than it did 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but because everything is so readily available all of the time. There is no off button anymore. Our lives are on display all of the time. Whether we want them to be or not, they are on display all the time because everything is accessible. And so what we need to understand is that whether you're a boy or a girl, a man or a lady, whether you're young, whether you're old, no matter what our background is, is that these concepts are telling us that we, you, me, should act and look a certain way all the time. And in part, we buy into it. Even when we don't want to, we buy into that message sometimes. And think about the way it's changed through history. I'm just going to pick three things here. Think about if you were living in ancient Egypt, somebody actually thought that that was a good look and a good idea, you know? I mean, I know not everybody may like this goatee, but the reality is that's a bad one right there. And when you see the pictures of, of the, the drawings that they have, that's a really bad scenario. But at some point and at some time in Egyptian history, this is what it was supposed to look like. And that was kind of cool and in to look like Pharaoh, you know? And think about the way our culture has still looked back to that culture and thought different portions and parts of it should still be something of an ideology, something of what we look at. And then think about this. If you're, I go to Africa often, and you know, when I'm over there, the Zulu tribe, they still dress like this often, not in all parts. Some parts they wear modern clothing and they just do this for show, but that culture, has dictated that this is what you should look like. This is what it means to fit into culture. This is what it means to be a part of their society, and this is the look you're supposed to have. I wouldn't mind that one so much. You have a spear in your hand all the time, so it could be fun. Last one is wrongly done on many occasions, but what about this? In the 19, late 30s and early 40s, one man had a concept and ideology that only this specific look this specific ethnicity, this specific background was good enough. And everything else was wrong, and he almost conquered the world built on that thought process because he inundated people's minds and concepts with that thought process and made people believe that that's what they were supposed to be and that was how they were supposed to think. So this is nothing new that our culture today has begun and tries and continues to dictate what our appearances should be, what our thoughts should be, what our processes and our practices, what cultural norms should be, are often pressed into our lives from the outside. From the outside, rather. To not have a hold or to fit in sometimes seems like a voodoo move in our culture. You're instantly an outsider if you don't go along with the cultural norms. But we're learning week after week, month after month, as we're studying the scriptures, we're learning that for the Christian, it's all about following God's standards. And God's standards are all we should ultimately be consumed with because if we live according to his standards, we're going to live a life that glorifies him. And when we glorify him and honor him, it doesn't mean our life is perfect by any means. It doesn't mean we're going to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. But what it does mean is we'll be doing what he called us to do with what he's blessed us with. We'll honor him, and therefore, we will be living in a way that honors him. And to do so means we will often live our lives in a counterculture way. We will often be doing things that will set us apart from the norm of society. And again, we need to embrace that when it happens rather than fearing it or staying away from it just because to be Christian means we're different does not mean it's a bad thing. So let's look at this concept through scripture because we're going to look at what the best version of you is tonight and it's important we embrace it. Lord, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you for loving us and thank you for your perfect design. I thank you for each individual that's here and for the fact that you created each and every one of us exactly as you wanted us to be. With the flaws we have and the issues we face and all of the things that go on in life, Lord, we are still exactly how you wanted us to be. And I pray, Lord, that we would embrace who it is that you designed us to be. 
that we would embrace all capacities of that. And whatever that means, that we would move forward trying to boldly live out our lives in the way that you designed for us. Lord, I pray that we would not make excuses, be blame shifters, try and find a, a different pathway in life than the one that you designed for us, but you would help us to recognize what it is you're calling us to, and then you'd empower us to walk in it. Lord, I know that everybody in this room is special, that you designed each one of us perfectly. And Lord, I pray that as our creator God, that you would bless us tonight, that you would honor yourself as we look at your word, and that you would move us to follow you in a more passionate way. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. First thing, the false allure of outside appearance. And I wanted to start here because I think this is the greatest trap in culture. Our culture is constantly sending us messages. All the time. Again, you can't watch a TV show without recognizing what the message is underneath it unless you're just not paying attention and seeing it. Commercials. Why do you think people, you know, will, will have the Super Bowl coming up in the beginning of February? Why do you think companies will spend millions of dollars to advertise during that game? Because there's a captive audience through which they can get their message, no matter what that message is. And they know it's a powerful medium, and so they pay it. And they are constantly sending a message that we, in this culture, should look and appear a certain way. This is nothing new. King Saul, if you remember, was really everything in appearance that a king should be. Israel was a monarchy. God was their king. And yet they said, no, 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 that's not good enough, God. We want to have a king just like all the other nations. They didn't need a king. They had him, but they wanted to be like everyone else. And so often we get caught in that trap of wanting to be like someone else. Whoever that someone is, we want to be like someone else because they have more of this or more of that or they're smarter or, you know, they're more handsome or they're prettier or they're built differently. We have these desires that come out and so often we just want to be like someone else. Well, King Saul was perfect. Look at 1 Samuel according to what people thought a king should be. 1 Samuel chapter 10 says this. Now, Samuel called the people together to the Lord at Mizpah. And he said to the people of Israel, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you from the hand of the Egyptians and from the hand of all the kingdoms that were opposing you. See, God was actively working in Israel's life, and they were missing it. And sometimes we're missing what he's doing in our lives because we're focusing on the wrong things. Mm -hmm. But today, you have rejected God who saves you from all your calamities and your distresses and have said to him, set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before the Lord by your tribes and by your thousands. Then Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near and the tribe of Benjamin was taken by lot. And he brought the tribe of Benjamin near by its clans and the clan of Matredes was taken by lot. And Saul, the son of Kish, was taken by Lot. But when they sought him, he could not be found. So they inquired again of the Lord, Is there a man still to come? And the Lord said, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. He was off hiding. Then they ran and took him from there. And when he stood among the people, don't miss this, when he stood among the people, he was taller than any of the people from the shoulders upward. And Samuel said to all the people, Do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? There is none like him among all the people. And all the people shouted, Long live the king. Do you see what's spoken about here? About Saul? It's not spoken about his great military mind. It's not spoken about the great leadership that he's exhibited in his young life. It's not spoken or noted any other factors or, or how he's built this great company, company or how he's done this great work. None of that is mentioned. What's mentioned is his height and his stature, the way he looks. All cultures throughout all history have put 
a focus on certain appearances and certain looks. And sometimes when that message is repeated over and over and over again, we think or desire or even wrongly desire to be <coughs> like someone else. Well, things didn't work out so well for King Saul. If you jump ahead to 1 Samuel chapter 16, we find this. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? It didn't take very long. Fill your horn with oil and go, and I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. And Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. And invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall, shall do. And you shall anoint for me him whom I declare to you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came and met him trembling and said, Do you come peaceably? They were worried because he was coming as a representative ultimately of the king, who now was being unseated, and they were very nervous about what was happening. And he said, Peaceably I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Notice what he did? He looked upon him. He looked at him. He saw his stature and the way he was built and how he looked and thought, well, that's got to be the one that's king. Again, because the focus is always on the outward. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. We don't want to miss that tonight. Because as I said, to some varying degree, now, historically, or maybe again in the future, some of us will have or maybe are struggling with outward appearance. Because we bought into the lie of what culture has presented before us. But God looks upon the heart, not the outward appearance. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, and Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen these. Then Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your sons here? And he said, There remains yet the youngest, but behold, he is keeping the sheep. And Samuel said to Jesse, send and get him, for we will not sit down till he comes here. And he sent them and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, a ruddy rather, and had beautiful eyes and was handsome. Again, outward appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. The Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Again, outward appearance has historically and today in our culture taken on so much focus and attention. We'll come back in the months ahead and look at David and his life, and we'll see both triumph and disaster take place in his life. And we'll see this lived out at a later date. In Luke chapter 20, we find this. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honors at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense or to catch people's attention, make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. So not only does our culture say you should look this way, you should act this way. This is what it means to look successful. This is what it means to be beautiful. This is what it means to be whatever. You fill it in. Our culture pushes that, but then there's more to it. We also are worried about the way things appear. 
No different than in this day. Sometimes we want to sit in the prominent position, or we want people to think highly of us, or we desire recognition, or we desire wrongful attention to be brought upon ourselves. And again, I believe that that comes from culture pushing into our lives what they say is the norm, but often opposes what scripture says is right. Mm -hmm. Humility is the value we're to hold. Mm -hmm. And it is in direct opposition of pride. God says he does not consider the outward appearance, but he considers the heart. Do you see the great conflict between culture and what our culture as Christians should be? One more scripture in this section, James chapter 2. And this is so important because it deals directly with the church body. And I see this take place all over in modern religion, in our churches. The way we do things is not based on scripture often. We just do things because we run our churches often like businesses run. And it's not often right. And we need to get back to the basics of how God designed his church to operate. That's why we're doing what we're doing. It's not because there's not other good churches and there's not other people doing good things. But in the midst of the good that's going on, there's a whole array of wrong going on and being taught. And all we're going to do is try and embrace what the New Testament says God's church is designed to be. We're just going to try and be that. Nothing more, nothing less. Because religion is not what it's about. Jesus hated religion. Mm -hmm. The only people he condemned were the religious leaders of his day. He stressed relationship. And relationship is based on what's inside more than what's outside. But look at here in James. My brothers, show no partiality. Have you thought about how hard that is? <laughs> to not show favor or partiality to someone because of who they are or what they've done or where they've been or how you can benefit from them. Show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in the good place while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen the, those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme and honor an, the honorable name by which you were called? You see, outward appearance it's just what it is. But it should not be the factor that dictates our decision making for ourselves and for how we view others. I believe that the factor in our culture that is pressed in harder than anything, especially to teenagers these days, is looks, mm -hmm. how you look and how you appear. Mm -hmm. And I believe it has done disastrous things to the young people of our culture and really to some of us if we look back honestly at the choices we've made in life and the way we've carried ourselves and the things maybe even we're currently doing but God does not want us to base things on outward appearance God is concerned with the heart so how do we turn this around second point is believing in God's perfect design I believe this is where it begins if we don't believe this, then we won't believe what it takes in order to right the ship in our own lives and to not be so concerned about outward appearances. Most of our culture has bought in to the great self-esteem movement. You guys will hear me, this is a pet peeve of mine, you'll hear me talk about this quite regularly. And at the surface, we all may think that, oh, it's a great thing to have great self-esteem and, and to value that, but if you really look what's underneath that agenda, 
And really, if you just look at 25 year olds and younger, you know what you find? Not to knock that part of our culture, but you know what you'll find? Because they are the ones where it really started being taught. Self-esteem, self-esteem, build your self-esteem, give everybody a participation trophy, those kinds of things. Oh, if not, you're gonna damage them. If they don't win, there's no losing. If you don't win, you're gonna be damaged. All those things were really taught about 25 years ago. You know what I found about those two generations? Often, it is the most selfish, self-centered generations that I have met. And I believe it has a ton to do with what they taught us to do to our kids and to teach our kids and what was taught in schools and, and what's been taught everywhere through media and all kinds of ways. The concept of you're wonderful and you always win in life is a lie. Mm -hmm. You are not always wonderful. Life is not always wonderful. And there are winners and there are losers in life. And sometimes we lose. And you know what? I've learned more from the losing side yeah. in life than I have from the winning right. side. Right. In fact, often when we win, it builds up that bad part of self to where we get prideful right. in what we do and humility goes out the door and you know what they say what comes after or, or pride help me pride comes before, pride the, fall. Comes before the fall yeah and it does and we know that and we experience that here's what we need to understand this is the right picture and again don't mistake what i say there is nothing wrong with having a proper viewpoint. In fact, you need to have a proper viewpoint of who you are. But that is a proper Christ esteem. Understanding who he designed you to be, that does not turn into arrogance. That turns into proper understanding. Here's what it looks like. And it begins here in Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Those are words of a designer God. And I know this isn't particularly popular today, but this is part of that culture being counter to the culture that we live in. You formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is you. We should all say that to ourselves. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. When you have a bad day, when you're feeling down, when you're not thinking too well about yourself, when you are struggling with negativity in your life, you might just want to have this verse written somewhere or saved in your phone and just say to yourself, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. That is God's viewpoint of yeah. me. What else really matters? Mm -hmm. That's it. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Yeah. That is the care of a creator God he knew exactly your life plan, and he knew it from before you even existed because you have been fearfully and wonderfully made. That's the start point of understanding this right viewpoint of being the best version of you. If you don't understand how you were created and how much God loves you, you will walk through life with a faulty understanding of who you are, which will lead you to more faulty understanding, which will lead you to bad decisions. Mm -hmm. And trust me, I've experienced it. We have to know the start point. Believing in God's perfect design. God created you with all your flaws, with all the issues that you have, but you are still created perfectly, exactly the way he wanted you to be because he is not a God who makes mistakes. Right. And we need to understand that. You don't need to live like anyone else. You need to learn to live like God designed you. Anybody here ever think or get stuck in the thought about how messed up you are? Mm -hmm. As you're struggling and as you're battling about how you don't look this way or feel this way or you're not as this as the other person and we get caught in that train wreck of thoughts yeah. and before you know it they're taking over 
and it's because we don't go back to the basics of understanding my God has created me and knit me together exactly the way it is. And even if all of you can't be as beautiful as this, I understand it. <laughs> That's a joke. But really, we get caught up. We get caught up in things that don't matter. Mm -hmm. We get caught up in the way we think we should look, in the way we think we should feel, in the way we think this should be or that should be. God has, Scott, you like that, didn't you? God has fearfully and wonderfully made us. That's all we need to know. But there's more. Psalm 56. You have kept count of my tossings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? By the way, when we're broken, it's always before God. And this is always such a cool scripture to me. The tears that we cry are actually captured by God. Nothing we do escapes his notice and his care. I mean, that is phenomenal. Down to that kind of detail. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know, that God is for me. In God, whose word I praise. In the Lord, whose word I praise. In God, I trust. I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? So not only do we understand that we are fearfully and wonderfully made, what we have to understand is that ultimately, ultimately my life and your life is in his hands. So I need to live fearlessly. Fearlessly. Fearlessly is how I have to live. It's how you have to live. Fear does one thing to the Christian. Can't take away heaven. Because we're eternally secure in Jesus Christ when we give our life to him. Can't take that away. But you know what it does? Fear makes us ineffective in what he's designed us to do. Right. I don't want to live ineffectively, and I know you don't want to live ineffectively. So we have to understand that he made us perfectly the way he wanted us to be. And that we have no need to ever live in fear. Fear is not of God. It absolutely is not. And we need to embrace that thought. My life is in his hands. Romans 8, 31 through 39. Great set of scriptures here. And this is all about understanding how we are designed. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but gave him up for all of us, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charges against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is, who, who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died, more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. By the way, if you ever get down, you might want to put that in your phone also. Jesus Christ is interceding for us. He is calling out our name before the Father. He is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword, as it is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long, we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, in other words, when your life is turned upside down, when things are going crazy, when it all seems like it's out of control, no, in all these things, here's who you really are. We, you, me, we are more than conquerors, through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must know how we were made. We must know who our maker is. Once we know who our maker is, we must fear nothing in life because there is nothing that is outside of his control. And therefore, we can trust. As bad as it gets in this life, we can trust yeah. he is in control. Yeah, right. He loves us. He bought us at a great price. And we are more than conquerors. Amen. Can you say that with me tonight? Say this. I am a conqueror. Let's try that. I, I am, am a conqueror. conqueror. That is Christian thinking. Not I'm a failure. Do we fail? Sure. But that doesn't make us a failure. Right. 
Not I'm a quitter. Do we quit at things sometimes? Sure. But does it make us failed? Does it make us a quitter in God's eyes? I will always be. You will always be more than a conqueror. We must understand that our value comes in who God made us to be and in who he is, not in the things we accomplish in this life. Yeah. Did you hear that? Yeah. Our value is not about what we do. It's about who we are. Right. That's right. Yeah. We have to understand that. And so this evening we recognize that there's a false allure of outward appearances. Then we recognize that we must believe in God's perfect design. And then here's how we bring it together. We must now that we recognize these things, learn to walk in the role that God designed for us. What does that look like, walking in your role? If God has designed you perfectly, then in order to be the best version of you, we simply have to walk in it. But that means changing thought processes. And how many recognize when we've done things for a while and it's become a habit, it's a little difficult to change, isn't it? I mean, really, yeah. think about anything you've tried to change. Mm -hmm. How many of us have tried to lose a little weight? Mm -hmm. It's hard to change habits. Yeah. How many of us <laughs> have tried to change the way that we walk through life or the way that we exercise or the way that we do anything? When you have constant thinking in your life that has formed a habit, it is very hard to change. Have you ever felt the pressure to be or to do something that you aren't or that you didn't want to do? Anybody ever face that? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Has culture or those who make it up led you to believe things about yourself that really aren't true, but you felt like it was true? Because it presses in and in and in. Have you ever been led to believe something about yourself, your abilities, or your life that has pulled you down or led you into a downward spiral? Again. We've all experienced that in varying degrees. This can happen very easily, and it happens when we put the cultural norms of our society above God's values and standards for our life, mm -hmm. and we get caught in this trap. When we compare ourselves to others and their successes and their outward appearance and the things that they've done in life, when we get caught in the comparison game, we lose perspective on reality and we start living according to the new reality we form. Right. And we have to understand that. So this is what we need to know. We need to know that God formed us <coughs> and made us perfectly in his image. That's the first thing we need to know. We need to know that God loved us from before time paramount for us to know that. We need to know that God designed us in order to glorify him. That's why he designed us. We need to know that God does not ever make mistakes. Mm -hmm. Never has, never will. There are no mistakes made by God. We need to know that God gave each of us everything that we need for life and godliness, because he tells us in his word he has done so. We need to know that God gave each one of us a specific and intentional purpose in life. And we need to know that God gave each of us a role to fulfill. So now we just need to know how to walk in it to be the best version of you. And I believe these two scriptures we're going to look at as we wrap this up tell us exactly what we need to do. 1 Corinthians 12. The Corinthian church was really messed up. We can learn so much about what the church is not to be by looking and studying the book of 1 Corinthians. It's amazing. And there are some great pieces in there. But this is one of the greatest scriptures dealing with the body of Christ, the local congregation as it gathers. Look what it says. For just as the body is one and has many, many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body. In other words, because I'm not quite like you, I just don't have any value. I'm not good enough. I don't bring anything to the table. That would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body. In other words, I don't have as much value, so 
Why be a part of it? That would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, if we were all the same, in other words, where would be the sense of hearing? And if the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, this is key, God arranged the members of the body, each one of them, as he chose. You know what that tells me about every local church? If we're following God to where he wants us to be as a part of a local congregation, it is by his perfect design that he brings you, 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 me. He brings us all together because we have the pieces that he needs to use in order to do the work that he wants to do in this immediate area. Because he arranged the members of the body, each one of them, and that includes you, exactly as he chose. And the context of the scripture is the local church. That's what it is. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Because we do that too. Not only do we sometimes get just kind of confused about who we are and what our specialty should be or how God designed us, sometimes we get confused about other people. And we think they're unimportant or they don't have value. And we look down upon them. There's no room for it. We can't do that. It says we can't do that. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body. He's the designer giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, this is the way the body functions, all members all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. See, that's how we operate. If you know that you're not to focus on the outward and on the cultural norms and the things that society says. And if you know that you have been wonderfully and perfectly made by a holy and perfect God, now you have to walk like you know it. We together have to live like we know it. We have to help each other to live according to this truth. And sometimes it gets hard. And it gets hard because we bought into all the lies for so, so long. One more scripture, same, same context, the body. Romans chapter 12. For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same functions, or same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us. Let us use them if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in serving, in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhort exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. You know what that tells me? God has a plan for the journey. And he has a plan for each and every one of us in this room. Mm -hmm. And his plan isn't dictated to us by the cultural norms or by what people say about you or think about you or want you to become or think you should be. It is all a part of God's perfect design for you. And you have a role to fulfill. And that role is based on how God has made you perfectly. And now all you have to do is get a sense through prayer, through the word, through discussion with other believers about what God wants you to do in your life and in this body. And you need to walk in it. Because when we walk in his perfect design, he is glorified. And when he is glorified, great things happen. And I am telling you, great things are ahead of us because we serve a great God 
and he wants to use each and every one of us. And in this church, no role is more important than another role. Right. It doesn't matter that I get the privilege to stand up here and teach. It makes my role no more important than yours. Differing roles, differing acts of service, differing ways to encourage each other. The people who get up here and lead us in worship, it's no important than any other role. We all have a role or roles to fulfill. We need to figure them out, get involved, and we need to think rightly about how God has designed us. Don't run after the world's passions and desires, but seek to fulfill the perfect role in God's perfect plan because of how he perfectly designed you so that you might maximize his honor and his glory. That's what God has for us this evening. That's what he's blessed us with from his word. Let's walk according to his plan by each of us becoming the best version of you that he designed us to be. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you again for your word, for your truth. And I thank you, Lord, for the way you've encouraged me this past week personally with these scriptures. Lord, I know that the outward the allure of what people think, the way we get caught up sometimes trying to please wrong people, wrong things, wrong desires. It can be so easily to be entrapped by it, Lord. I pray that you would set us all free of that and that we would understand what your design is and what your plan is and what the perfect makeup for each one of us is and that you would help us to walk in it. Lord, we just want to glorify you. We don't want to be religious. We want to be relational. Relational with you, relational with one another. We want to be a church that recognizes, Lord, who you are, what you're doing. We simply want to be involved. And we pray that you would bring us into the midst of what you're doing in this area. We pray you'd use us powerfully to impact the lives of those you've placed in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that we would see many come to know you and glorify you. Because we just want to be used by you. Lord, if anyone here tonight is struggling with feeling down about who they are or some of this has really touched home, Lord, with the way that they've bought into the lies of the culture that surrounds us, I pray you'd encourage them. Let them find somebody they can confide in and talk with within this group. And then let us help each other to come out of that and to embrace your perfect design for our lives. Lord, we glorify you. We honor you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.